Welcome back. So in the last few lectures, we've been talking about balance model reduction, which means you take a high dimensional system that you know you have the system, you can simulate it, and you there's a procedure essentially for finding a coordinate transformation that gives you a reduced order model that's much faster to simulate, and it gives you the most controllable and observable uh, dynamics. It captures the most input-output energy of your system. So that is a very interesting perspective. It's called model reduction. It assumes you have the model. Lots of times we do. I have the Navier-Stokes equations. I know what fluids do. I have the equations of really complicated uh, multi-joint robots. I know what they do. But for lots of systems, all I have is measurement data. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is system identification to get balanced models. So kind of, I'm going to just call this balanced uh, system identification, SysID, system identification. And what we're going to be talking about in, in particular is the Eigen system, the Eigen system uh, realization algorithm. Very, very, very powerful algorithm. I use it all the time. Algorithm, okay. One of the rules never spell in public. Eigen system realization algorithm, ERA. Uh, this was developed by Wong and Papa, pretty sure, Wong and Papa, in 1985, okay? So very shortly after Moore came out with his 1981 paper, uh, Wong and Papa in 1985 came out with this Eigen system realization algorithm, which is still my go-to method for linear system ID. This is, let's say, linear uh, linear system ID. I'll tell you all about nonlinear system ID later. Um, super powerful stuff, kind of modern method based on machine learning. But my go-to linear system ID method is the Eigen system realization algorithm from Wong and Papa. Uh, it turns out, actually, this, this took a couple of decades to figure out. But it turns out that this ERA gives equivalent models to balance POD, balance proper orthogonal decomposition. Remember, it's very much equivalent uh, in some circumstances, to BPOD, um, the Rowley 2005 uh, BPOD. And this connection was established by John Wah Ma uh, in a 2011 TCFD paper. You can Google uh, John Wah Ma and Rowley TCFD 2011, and you can find the connection. It's really cool. But remember, BPOD and balanced truncation and more and Rowley always assume that you had access to this direct and adjoint system. You had your A, B, and C matrices, or you had a simulation that could give you data and adjoint data, and the ERA doesn't. All that ERA assumes is that you have measurement data of your complex system, and it gives you an equivalent balanced reduced order model. So it's awesome, okay? And um, so this is going to be an overview. I'm going to show you what the overview is, and then we're going to dive into a lot of math because there's steps, and it could get really kind of hairy. Um, so what is the overview? The overview is um, we, are, we assume, so there's a basic assumption, so assume that our system is in fact linear. And I'm always going to do this in discrete time dynamics if I do impulse responses because it's so much easier. We assume that we have a system, uh, this thing like, like this, and we're going to assume that yk equals cxk. And for now, I'm just going to assume that there might be the possibility of a feed-through term uh, so that my actuation u directly gives an, imp an impact on my measurement y. So I have these four matrices, a, b, c, and d. Now, I do not assume that I know what these are. All I'm assuming is that my system can be described, the input-output dynamics of my system can be described in terms of some, uh, some linear system. So we also assume that we measure uh, u and y, but not x directly. In fact, I don't even know what the state of my system is. I don't know what those variables even mean. I'm going to get some latent variables, some hidden variables that are necessary to describe the input-output dynamics, but they might have nothing to do physically with things uh, in my system. So we can measure u and y, but we can't measure the big full state of my system directly. This is kind of the assumption. Uh, what's the other assumption? So the other assumption, I guess, is that I can do what's called an impulse response experiment. Okay, So an impulse response experiment. Um, I can do an impulse response. 
And what an impulse response is, is this u, so I'm assuming I have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, so everything's a vector. Um, what an impulse response is, is u, uh, u, k, I'm going to call it delta, okay, I'm going to call my impulse response delta. It assumes that at time zero, I can hit u with a delta function, and then for all future times, u is zero. So this is going to be, um, what is this? This is going to be an identity matrix for k equals zero, and it's going to be a zero matrix for k greater than zero. And this is an identity matrix because this is a vector of inputs. If it was a single input and single output, this would be easier. This would just be a one. I impulsively kick u equals one at time zero, and then I drop it off to zero afterwards. Um, and what's kind of cool is I can actually write down my output response analytically. So yk given a delta is equal to, um, and we're kind of assuming uh, x not equals zero, initial, zero initial condition. So it starts at rest. I whack it with a hammer. That's my impulse response. And I measure how the system evolves. Um, so if x was zero at time zero, and I give you an impulse, an input, then y zero equals d. Okay, that's d at time step k equals zero. And then for all future time steps, now x equals b, and then x equals, so y equals cb. Then x would equal ab, and y would equal cab, and so on and so forth. So this will be c a to the k minus one b for all bigger, uh, all positive k. And so if I was going to draw this in a picture for single input and single output, you know, I, I do draw this quite a bit. Uh, let me give myself two axes, okay? Then what my u looks like is this, it's unit at time zero. It's this unit discrete time impulse. So this is all discrete time. So this is a, an impulse is like a little rectangle where it's just on at time zero and it's off at all future times. And what y is going to happen is it's going to have some dynamics that respond, and I'm just making dynamics up as I go. It's going to have some response that is measured discreetly in time given that impulse. That's what these, uh, these measurements are. So y is going to you know, ring through the system. And what ERA is going to do, what ERA tries to do, so we're going to this is our data, okay? This is our data for ERA. It's purely data driven. It's experimental data. I impulse my system, I measure why. I take this data and I pipe it through ERA. And what ERA gives me is it gives me a reduced order A, a reduced order B, and a reduced order, let's say, C and D. Um, of the dimensions, so this is a rank R model. So this is a rank R model. And so I could write down my system x tilde k plus 1 equals a r x tilde k plus b r u k y k equals c r uh, x tilde k plus d u k. Notice I didn't put a tilde on d because the dimensions of my u and y, the inputs and outputs, those never change. I can't reduce those. I have five inputs, I keep five inputs. I have five outputs, I keep five outputs. So this D matrix is still size five by five or whatever it is. This can't be reduced. But what I can do is I can learn, I'm learning from data. This is really machine learning. If you wanna think about it, you're learning a model that describes your data that generalizes. So this is machine learning, it's old machine learning. I learned from my impulse response data the A, B, and C matrices of rank R that best approximate the U to Y dynamics, the measured input-output response. So this is kind of a black box model. If you think about it, this is my system, my ERA system is designed to take U's and give Y's in a way that's most faithfully representing the data of rank R model, given a rank R model. That's what ERA does. Um, Pretty simple. I should probably tell you uh, why this was developed. Let's see if I can draw my uh, Hubble Space Telescope 
It's not the best Hubble ever drawn, but you get the picture. So in 1985, um, you know, we were in the space race. This is super exciting. We were putting up the Hubble and the space station and, and the space shuttle and designing all of these aerospace structures. And these structures generally have vibrational modes, okay? You, um, you kick the system, you do something, and it oscillates. You're trying to make it as light as possible, okay? So you're trying to make this thing as light as possible. It's going to vibrate. It's going to have um, kind of these, these structural waves going through it. And this is a pretty hard system to model from first principles. It's hard, just like in the, you know, that example, it's hard to open a textbook and find the equation for the Hubble Space Telescope. So instead, what Wong and Papa and others, um, Fan and Longman, and, and there's a lot of great people that have that are worked in this field, what they do is they build models and mock-ups, or they run, you know, big simulations of this thing, and they collect impulse response data. You hit it with a hammer and you see how the system rings, um, rings through. You collect that measurement data Y and you directly build a reduced order model for, for that input output system. Okay, so that's where this came from was kind of aerospace structure vibrations, but now we're applying this to huge systems and turbulence control. Um, it's applied all over the place, super useful method. This is the roadmap. We are going to assume that all we have is data Impulse output, input output data. This is what we actually have as the in. This is our inputs. Okay, the input is impulse response data. We can measure impulse response data. The assumption is that there's some linear system that governs the observed behavior. Um, that you know that, that there's some linear system under the hood going on here. These, you know, for small perturbations, that's a pretty good assumption here. If I have small amplitude perturbations, this is a pretty linear system. And so you basically assume that you had a linear system. You write down what would be the linear impulse response if I had a linear system. And then I basically try to back out what are the best rank R, A, B, and C, and D matrices that agree with that data. That's what we're going to do with ERA. Uh, that's all coming up. We're going to work through how to do this math, and we're also going to talk about how this is connected to balance model reduction, balance truncation, and balance POD. Uh, and we'll code it up. All right, thank you.